In this video, you will learn the basics of cryptography. One of the great things about cryptography is that there are only three different methods you need to learn. They are symmetric key encryption, asymmetric key encryption, and hashing. Let's take a look at each of them, starting with symmetric key encryption. As you will see in a minute, symmetric key encryption is pretty much used everywhere. It's used for data at rest for whole disk encryption, file encryption, and database encryption. It is also used for data in motion for SSL, which stands for Secure Socket Layer, also known as TLS, which stands for Transport Layer Security, and for IPsec. Today, just about everyone uses the advanced encryption standard algorithms for bulk encryption. That is, they use either AES-128 or AES-256. In fact, many processors have hardware acceleration for AES encryption using a method called Galois Counter Mode, or GCM. In a later video, we will examine this mode in a good bit of detail. The important thing is that with AES GCM encryption, your laptop computer will experience less than a 1% performance impact when sending and receiving data. The software defined perimeter and precision access use AES-256 symmetric key encryption for single packet authorization and for mutual TLS communication from the clients to the controllers and gateways and between the controllers and gateways also. It is important to note that symmetric key encryption is shared key encryption, which means that the same key that is used to encrypt a message is also used to decrypt it. Therefore, the key must be kept secret, and it is very difficult to transmit a secret across an untrusted network. And that's why we have asymmetric key encryption. Asymmetric key encryption, also known as public key cryptography, enables the exchange of secrets over an untrusted network where malicious devices and people can observe and or modify all traffic. And it allows us to do this secretly, meaning encrypted, and with data integrity, meaning the message was signed. However, asymmetric key encryption only works on small messages, smaller than the key itself, where the keys range in size from a couple of hundreds of bits to a couple of thousands of bits. Therefore, in practice, asymmetric key encryption is used for only two things, encrypting symmetric keys, which we talked about in the previous slide, and encrypting hashes, which we will talk about on the next slide. There are three asymmetric key encryption standards commonly used today, Diffie-Hellman, RSA, and the Digital Signature Standard. We'll see these used in more detail in later videos. The Software Defined Perimeter and Precision Access use asymmetric key encryption for encrypting symmetric keys before storing them on disk, for exchanging symmetric keys during the mutual TLS handshake, and for generating and validating X509 certificates. With the first two encryption methods, we have been able to encrypt bulk data using symmetric key encryption and transport the secret keys for that encryption over an untrusted network using asymmetric key encryption but we don't know if someone has tampered with the data along the way. Therefore, we need the third method of cryptography, hashing. Hashing, also commonly referred to as generating a message authentication code, or MAC, converts an arbitrarily long message into a single number, where the goal of the algorithm is to create a unique hash for each message. Typical values for these codes are 2 raised to the 256th power, or raised to the 384th or 512th power, which correspond to the common standards we will see in a second. But first, as you can see on the slide, even the smallest of these values is a very large number. In fact, it's approximately equal to the number of atoms in the observable universe. Another thing to know about a hash is that it cannot be reversed. Once you hash a message, you cannot convert the hash back to your message. Therefore, Instead, to check the integrity of a message, one rehashes the original message and then compares the two hash values. If they are the same, then the message has not been altered. Today, the most common standard for hashing is the secure hash algorithm number one, that is, SHA-1. However, this standard has recently been considered insecure for long-term use, and the newer SHA-2 family of hashes is recommended. As noted, SHA-2 is a family of hashes. Often you will hear reference to SHA-256 or SHA-384, where this means the SHA-2 standard with a 256 or 384-bit output. 
More recently, a new secure hash algorithm was released, SHA-3, but it's uncommon to see it being used at present. And you should also know about Message Digest 5, or MD5, invented in the early 1990s and widely used up until a few years ago. Today it is considered cryptographically broken as state-sponsored organizations have been able to create their own messages that generate the same hash value as a trusted MD5 hash. This is referred to as a collision, and it breaks the primary objective of hashing. The software-defined perimeter and precision access use hashing to create the one-time password and GMAC of single packet authorization, and for the integrity of the TLS handshake, and for hashing X509 certificates, and for the derivation of the TLS symmetric keys and initialization vectors. That last use case takes a little more explaining. As opposed to using a hash to prove the authenticity of a message, in this case, one master key is used to create two or more derived keys by iteratively hashing the master key. This is very common in TLS, where the handshake between the client and the server is all about creating the master key, typically via asymmetric key encryption, and then using a hashing function such as SHA-384 to derive the two symmetric keys and two initialization vectors required for the Galois counter mode AES encryption. So there you have it. Cryptography consisting of only three methods as shown here. At the same time, you should know that the three methods are almost always used in combination. As an example, let's look at the TLS suite Vitter uses for encrypting communication among the components of the software-defined perimeter. The first three letters TLS indicated as a TLS suite. The first parameter, EC, stands for elliptic curve, and it is a way of generating the asymmetric keys that will be put into the key derivation function we just looked at. The second parameter is Diffie-Hellman ephemeral, which is a method for exchanging those asymmetric keys. Next, RSA is a method for authenticating clients to servers and servers to clients using X509 certificates, which themselves use asymmetric key encryption and hashing. Then, AES-256 is our friend for doing bulk encryption, and GCM is a way of doing both encryption and hashing at the same time using AES-256. Finally, SHA-384 is the key derivation function for deriving the keys and initialization vectors for the AES-256 encryption from the elliptic curve master key which was exchanged across the untrusted network using Diffie-Hellman asymmetric key encryption. Hopefully, now you see how easy it is to understand cryptography.